protesting around this country, preaching the gospel of the Negro Leagues and the virtues of his museum, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, to any and everybody who would listen. In many ways, he was indeed an evangelist. And this was the joy of his life, particularly after his late wife, Aura, passed away eerily the day after we opened the new museum in 1997. And so for the next 16 years, he established this museum in 1990. And for those next 16 years, this is what drove Buck. He wanted them to be remembered. But you know what, Scott? I think in the final equation, that's what we all want. We don't want people to forget us. And Buck wanted people to know this story. And he wanted those unsung baseball heroes of the Negro League to be remembered for what they had contributed, not only to our sport, but to our country. And so he dedicated those last 16 years of his life to build this museum. And he was doing it in a volunteer capacity, serving as the chairman of this museum. I meet Buck for the first time in 1993. And I started as here as a volunteer with his organization. Who knew? You go from being a volunteer <laughs> to now trying to run this great institution. And I consider myself to be a baseball fan. Like most, I really didn't know a whole lot about the Negro Leagues. I knew the names Satchel Page, Cool Papa Bell, Josh Gibson, those names transitioned went mainstream. But I had no idea about the breadth, scope, magnitude in which these leagues represented both on and off the field. And as I tell people all the time, I met Buck O'Neill. And as I oftentimes say, when you're bitten by the Buck bug, it's a wrap. <laughs> you want to be on Buck's team. The, the charisma, the energy, the passion that he had for this story. It was infectious. And I just wanted to help in any way I possibly could. So I volunteered for the organization for five years before becoming its first director of marketing in 1998. Served in that capacity for 10 years before I left in, in 2010, for 12 years. In 2010, I left as VP of marketing for this organization, left for about 13 months, and then came back in 2011, and really in an improbable return to come back and serve as president of this organization. And there's not a single day that goes by that I don't think about Buck O'Neill. He has had as much influence on my life as anyone. The wisdom that was there, the insight, the thoughtfulness, the engagement, the connectivity that transcended race, age, gender was all significant. And I try and draw from as much of that as I'm making decisions day to day here for the Negro Leagues Museum. It energizes me when I'm doing, when I ain't feeling you know, things ain't going the way you always want them to go. I think I draw strength from Buck. And he continues to have a huge presence in this community. And he continues to have a huge presence in the baseball world. And this year, Buck will have been gone for 14 years. It's still hard to believe that he's been gone 14 years because everywhere I go, somebody got a Buck O'Neill story. And I never get tired of hearing them. Bring them on. Bring them on. You, know, you have a favorite? Man, there's so many. But mm -hmm. I think my favorite Buck O'Neill story was both the, perhaps the most disappointing day in my life and perhaps one of the most inspirational days in my life. And that was the day he didn't get inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame, February 27, 2006. And we all thought, everybody in the baseball world thought it was going to be a shoe-in that Buck O'Neill was going to get in the Hall of Fame. In many respects, the process was essentially set up for Buck to get in the Hall of Fame, but it didn't happen. And we were sitting right here in this conference room when I had to walk in here and deliver the news to him. He's sitting right there in that chair. And I had to walk in and deliver the news to him that he didn't get in the Hall of Fame. My dear friend, the great sports writer, Joe Posnansky, who is the author of a beautiful book on Buck called The Soul of Baseball, a road trip through Buck O'Neill's America. Joe was sitting right here in this chair. I go over to the opposite side. And man, I'm trying to collect myself because I don't know how I'm going to tell him because we thought this thing was a wrap. He's in. Matter of fact, we were going to fly to Tampa, Florida that day to be there to participate in the Hall of Fame press conference the very next day. 
And, and I remember sitting there and I'm just trying to collect my thoughts to tell him that he didn't get in. And when I say, and I ultimately say, well, Buck, we didn't get enough votes. And he looks up at me and he smiles. He says, that's how the cookie crumbles. And in the next voice, he asked me who had, how many had gotten in. I said, 17. I'll be honest. I was furious because in my mind, you couldn't put 17 in and leave Buck out. Well, he is the table in utter jubilation. He is excited that 17 of his colleagues had gotten their rightful place in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. He asked me who they were. And I didn't have that information at that point in time. And the next words that came out of his mouth, I wonder if the Hall of Fame will invite me to speak. Now, Joe Paz had turned beet red. He is furious. He looks at Buck. He says, Buck, you wouldn't do that, would you? Buck says, Joe, of course I would. What has my life been about? And I said, well, Buck, I need to go downstairs because down on our field of legends where the life-size statues are, well over 300 people had gathered for what we all thought was going to be a Hall of Fame celebration announcement. I said, Buck, I got to go downstairs. I need to go deliver the news. I'll come back and get you. I think you should come down and address the group, and then we'll let everybody go home. It's been a long day. Well, as I oftentimes tell the story, from our upstairs conference room to the Field of Legends was the longest walk of my life. I am literally trying to coach myself, Bob, you can't cry. This is your job. You got to suck it up. You can't cry. The more I'm telling myself not to cry, tears are steady building up in my eyes. We get to the podium, and the podium was at second base, and I really don't even remember what I said, but whatever it was, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. People were openly emotional about what had taken place. Buck walks in through our gift shop. The room erupts into this thunderous ovation. And Buck O'Neill walks up to the podium, for lack of a better term, delivered one of the most amazing concession speeches that I'd ever heard. What he did that day was he literally implored all of us not to be angry, not to be bitter, not to express any ill will toward anyone who had anything to do with this decision. Scotty said, I had an opportunity. And this, this great country of ours, that's all you could ever ask. They didn't think old Buck was good enough. We got to live with that. But if I'm a Hall of Famer in your eyes, that's all that matters to me. Just keep on loving old Buck. Now I'm over in the corner. I'm a wreck at this point in time. Tears are just free flowing. But what he did that day was he literally reached out his arms, wrapped them around all of us and said, it's okay. Instead of us consoling him, he's consoling us in what I still believe to be one of the most amazing displays of strength of character that I'd ever witnessed. Hmm. He would push aside his own disappointment, go to Cooperstown, deliver this impassioned speech on behalf of 17 others who did not have a voice. They were all dead. And what I still say to be the most selfless act in American sports history, a little over two months later, old Buck passed away himself at age 94, a month shy of his 95th birthday. I tell my, my guests all the time, particularly my young audience, what Buck O'Neill taught us that fateful day in February of 2006 was a tremendous lesson on how to handle disappointment. Yeah. And, and and so out of all the things that I ever encountered with this man, I think that moment, that single moment in time will stay with me for the rest of my life. Or as my mother would say, as long as I'm in my natural mind, I, I, I draw inspiration from that day. As disappointing as it was for all of us to see him rise above the disappointment the way that he did. And then to see how this country reacted to the way he handled that disappointment. It is something that I will carry with me again the rest of my life. And, and so with all the great stories that he shared with us about the hero, heroes of the Negro Leagues and all the great moments that he and I had traveling all over this country, that's probably the thing that stays with me. And people always ask me, what do I remember most about Buck? And the thing that I share with them is you always felt better when you left Buck than you mm -hmm. did before you came to see him. 
And there's very few folks that impact you like that. No, and, and so there was something very special about John Jordan Buck O'Neill. And, and I tell people, I'm one that subscribes to the belief that we all have a purpose. We're all here for a purpose. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes we don't identify what that purpose is. Other times we run from that purpose. Buck embraced his purpose. He did. And, and then he carried it and he lived it out so that we could all see this unfold right before our eyes. Again, it goes back to the fact that you can get further in this life of love than you can with hate. And he exuded that. And because of that, so many people, I think, were connected to Buck O'Neill. And that's why everybody has a Buck story. Hmm. And when Buck O'Neill passed away, we knew it would be the single most biggest thing to ever happen to this museum. And it was. Hmm. And I'll never forget, we had his wake we had a viewing on the Field of Legends. And uh, it didn't surprise me the number of people came through. Some 15,000 people came by to say goodbye to Buck. And that didn't surprise me the sheer number. We knew how beloved Buck was. But where they came from is a testament to who Buck O'Neill was. They were CEOs of major corporations. They were political dignitaries. They were sports athletes. They were hustlers. They were homeless. They were black, white, men, women, young, old. Buck O'Neill identified with everybody. And when I say homeless, I literally mean homeless because he fed so many of the homeless. And and they, too, felt compelled to come and say goodbye to Buck O'Neill. In the spirit of what you just said there, as best we can wrap up the story of the Negro Leagues, Instead of just talking about how after integration it declines, yeah, you, I mean, you already touched on that, but you mentioned that the Negro League embodies the American spirit of perseverance. Yes. After integration, beyond the all time great players that joined the league, Hank Aaron, others yeah. as well, what do you think the players and the rest of the Negro League coming into Major League Baseball did to bring that spirit in and make it richer just beyond great players? Well, first, it starts with the fact that we make the bold assertion that Jackie Robinson's breaking of the color barrier wasn't just a part of the civil rights movement. It was the beginning of the civil rights movement. It's Mm -hmm. 1947. This is well before those more noted civil rights occurrences. This is before Brown versus the Board of Education. This is before Rosa Parks' refusal to move to the back of the bus. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a sophomore at Morehouse College when Robinson signs his contract to play in the Dodgers organization. President Truman would not integrate the armed forces until a year after Jackie. So for all intents and purposes, this is what started the ball of social progress rolling in our country. And that's why we talk about the Negro Leagues from a context that this is a story that is far bigger than baseball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a far more grandiose story than just reducing it to the game of baseball, even though it's just a tiny part of the great story of the game of baseball. And so those subsequent players who transitioned into major leagues, what they were doing was they were carrying that spirit of the Negro Leagues along with them. And as my dear friend, the late great Buck O'Neill would say, it's very, very seldom in our society that we remember the people who built the bridge. More times than not, we remember the people who cross over the bridge. The Negro Leagues Museum celebrates the people who built the bridge so that the Henry Aarons and the Willie Mazes and the Ozzy Smiths and the Dave Winfields and the, even the contemporary Hispanic and, and Major League African-American ball players could cross over. And that's why even as I welcome my young Major Leaguers here, if you are of African-American and Hispanic descent, you owe a great deed of gratitude to the Negro Leagues. There is no and if buts about it. Had it not been for the Negro Leagues, you don't play. And, and But the spirit, the winning spirit that was embedded in this story still plays on today. Mm -hmm. The legacy of the Negro League still plays on today. And it's our job to help make the story relevant to what is happening in the lives of so many people in our society today, particularly young people. And every day, that's what we're doing. We're challenging ourselves to draw those connections uh, from a generational standpoint, from the understanding of the importance of tolerance, respect, all these things come out of this one story 
that was built around just a simple desire to play baseball.